This is a four-wheel drive skid steering robot chassis that operates very similar to the popular Sherp vehicle, which can go just about anywhere. <laughs> and in this video, we are going to test this thing to its limits to see what it takes to break it, if we even can. I'm literally gonna test this thing off of a ramp and through other random obstacles, but we're also going to see how this thing performs in extreme weather conditions like snow and flooding. We'll also cover speed performance and payload, but I wanna stress that I don't want any bit of this test to be easy. And finally, we'll also talk about the design and build of this guy. Now, before we go down the testing rabbit hole, we really need to understand why I even built this thing. When I was working on my self-driving RC truck, I realized something. The large turning radius makes it very difficult for obstacle avoidance and turning in tight areas. But with skid steering, I can have a zero turn platform that can literally spin on its own axis. I didn't buy an existing system on the market because they're either really expensive for high quality ones or they're cheaply made and they load the motor bearings or loader, motor gearboxes directly and that's gonna really lead to reduced reliability and performance in the long run. So I designed this guy to solve those issues. One of the keys of the design is that it uses dedicated bearing hubs to ensure the motor and transmission don't ever see any impact or high vibration loads. And the power plant is two Traxxas XL5 setups with dedicated transmissions that allow me to change gearing as needed. I'm using a signal mixer for differential steering and the wheels on each side are joined together with a bell drive system, so I only need to run two motors instead of four. This thing was really cost effective because I could fabricate the chassis out of sheet metal on my plasma table and form them on my hydraulic press. I machined the bearing hubs myself on my CNC router and the miscellaneous brackets could all be 3D printed. I could also spot weld most of it together and use hand tools for just about the rest, except I was missing one key tool, a lathe. You see these drive shafts are precision machined stainless steel and they integrate several different functions including the drive pulley, bearings, wheel hex, and nut. This is one of the most critical parts on the system because it can have a huge impact on the performance if it's not machined to certain tolerances. I ended up using a company called Fictive that provided some really great machining options at an awesome price, especially when you compare to standard domestic quotes. It's as simple as dragging a file into the browser for a near instant quote and several options ranging from domestic to offshore supply. I like it because like a typical millennial, I don't have to talk to a single person the whole time if I don't want to. I should point out that they did not sponsor this video in any way, but I have written technical articles for them way back when all they did was 3D printing, and I was just so happy to see the quality of their machine services now that I wanted to talk about it and let all the like normal folks that don't have a huge supply chain backing them like small companies and hobbyists know that there are other options to procure machined components. Now back to the platform. Remember it's designed to be tough, so we really have to be aggressive and push this thing to the limits if we wanna find out what it's made of. Luckily for me, Texas got hit with a rare snow event that created the perfect opportunity. My first true test was in the neighborhood where I was just making sure the controls did what I wanted. Um, and shortly after I started, I was attacked by my son just a few minutes into it, which meant I had to move on to the backyard. And everything started out good, but again, I wasn't as productive as I hoped because of this guy. He was all over the place trying to help me throughout this testing. What are you doing on the table? So I had to go to the park to really get any meaningful testing done. And on the playground, this thing performed exceptionally well. But aside from the inclines and a little bit of maneuverability, that's not really a tough challenge. When I got out in the rough fields with lots of sticks and weeds, I thought it was gonna be much more of a challenge, but this thing actually still ate it up. But now I'm gonna shut up for a little bit so we can enjoy some test footage. I want to note that the tires I'm using here are called sand paddles, which work really well for, well, sand obviously, but really loose terrain on firm surfaces. And that's really great for the thin layer of soft snow on this frozen lake here. But they do tend to high center more than I'd like when they're on really thick, 
Loose surfaces, this is especially true for really thick snow that the tire really can't get deep enough in to keep itself from high centering. Which means we're gonna yank these things off and put some much taller tires on. So tall in fact that the car can now drive completely upside down, doesn't really care which way it's going anymore. Now when we hit the snow, we get a lot more clearance so we don't get stuck as much and we're gonna have a lot more fun. And much to my surprise, snow really wasn't as much of a challenge as I expected. But what about flooded areas after heavy rain that are loaded down with water and debris? About a week after the snow melted, my area also got really heavy rain that flooded this local park and there was debris scattered everywhere from all the runoff. So we're gonna use this as our new proving grounds. The debris wasn't actually too much of a problem unless I was going too fast. But I should mention that this platform doesn't actually float, so I wasn't really sure how it would handle deeper puddles at all. But I did design all of the electronics to be waterproof, so as long as I got signal, this thing would just drive completely submerged on the bottom of whatever puddle it was in, uh, and then get itself out. So I decided it was time to get messy. After soaking everything and completely beating this thing up, I figured it was time to see how this thing would handle at higher speeds. And it was pretty controllable in like the 13 to 15 mile per hour range. Beyond that, it was really hard to track in a straight line. But still, 15 miles an hour is way higher than most of the competition out there, and it is exactly in line with what I was targeting. Like I mentioned, I also wanted to test a few obstacles, and what better obstacle than a ramp for RC cars, right? Absolutely no problem. I could stick the landing. I could fly off at any angle I wanted and because the wheels are so big relative to the body, they kind of act as a huge shock absorber. Which meant it was no surprise at all that I could go downstairs at a reasonable speed, see no damage, and as long as I was careful, control it straight down the path. But I did have a lot of trouble going upstairs it would just flip itself over, both stairs and small curbs. So if it wasn't sloped, I was probably gonna end up on my back. Actually, even just sitting still, if I hit the throttle hard, this thing would flip itself over. And lastly, I wanted to test payload which is a pretty useless test. And I only say it's useless because the payload in this case is extremely sensitive to just how I set the car up, the gears I use, the tires I use and all that, which I could control either way. Regardless, I threw one of my 40 pound dumbbells on there, drove around a little bit, it was okay. It could move, but it couldn't go over anything because the slipper clutch would just slip. With 20 pounds, it was relatively unaffected. But again, this is kind of a useless test because it is just so dependent on how I set it up initially. Through all this testing and through all of this abuse, I was really surprised that nothing ever broke. I mean, nothing broke. Uh, the only thing that I would say was a drawback is when I got this thing super soaking wet, the slipper clutches on the transmissions 
dropped way down in the torque they could transmit just as a function of the design. Um, so I would probably change a few things just to improve the design. I would definitely make it narrower to prevent some of the high centering and maybe a slightly higher wheelbase. But this was a great baseline. And the main thing I needed to prove were these wheel hubs. The wheel hubs were awesome. There was no damage. They did what I wanted. They're rebuildable. So I feel like I could scale this platform to a much larger setup without very much redesign at all and feel confident that it would perform very well. I should also talk about the belts. The belts I used here originally were these really small GT2 belts because I had a ton of them laying around, but I had already done the math to know that they were unlikely to be able to transmit the torque I wanted with the larger tires. And that was 100% true. You can hear the horrible slipping sound they make whenever they're under very little load. But luckily for me, since I had started doing that math before everything came in, I had also ordered XL belts from another company that would basically retrofit into the exact same footprint, and I was good to go. Those belts almost never slipped, except when they were under really high torque load and submerged. Both friction was down and obviously torque's high, so I heard a little bit of clicking, but no major problems. It could still plow through the water, get me where I wanted to go, and I was happy. Now, if you want a little bit more detail on this bearing hub, let's jump into the CAD model. The first thing I've done is space the bearings as far apart as I can to give myself moment resistance and more stiffness. They're spaced apart with precision spacers, which is very important with bearings, and there's a kind of a shim spacer on either side. On the other end of the drive shaft, it's hard to see, but I have another bushing and a spring-loaded section to keep the bearing under some degree of preload so it's not actually floating, even though there's a tiny amount of movement if I don't have that in there. And then obviously I've got the features for the wheel hex and wheel nut. Um, but the, the main thing I was going for with this bearing hub is scalability. I wanted to be able to take this exact same architecture and just scale it up to larger components for a larger, higher payload system. And I've definitely accomplished that. I would choose different bearings and there are a lot of nuances with bearing hub design, so don't think it's just as simple as copy and pasting, but I am very confident that this design proves that there's a lot of ways to get a much, much higher payload 4x4 chassis like this out there with relatively minimal design effort, just scaling. Now, I did a ton of testing, and I want to include some more of those highlights, so here's a blend of a bunch of the different tests that maybe didn't make into the earlier part of this video, just to show how hard we put this thing through the paces. Another interesting design note, the very first chassis I made was made out of 11 gauge steel, which put it at like 15 pounds, which is pretty heavy for something this scale. And then I realized I could just go to, I think this is 16 gauge, cut a ton of weight off, and this was more than strong enough. So if I were going with a higher scale, maybe a one fifth scale, sure, 11 gauge is great but the 16 gauge worked perfect for this guy. Okay, that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to let me know. I'll get back to you as quickly as I can.